Chapter Six of the Border Legion by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Joan returned to consciousness, she was lying half outside the opening of the cabin, and above her was a drift of blue gun smoke, slowly floating upward. Almost as swiftly as perception of that smoke came a shuddering memory. She lay still, listening. She did not hear a sound except the tinkle and babble and gentle rush of the brook. Kells was dead then, and overmastering the horror of her act was a relief, a freedom, a lifting of her soul out of the dark dread, a something that whispered justification of the fatal deed. She got up and, avoiding to look within the cabin, walked away. The sun was almost at the zenith. Where had the morning hours gone? I must get away, she said suddenly. The thought quickened her. Down the canyon the horses were grazing. She hurried along the trail, trying to decide whether to follow this dim old trail or endeavor to get out the way she had been brought in. She decided upon the latter. If she traveled slowly and watched for familiar landmarks, things she had seen once, and hunted carefully for the tracks, she believed she might be successful. She had the courage to try. Then she caught her pony and led him back to camp. What shall I take, she pondered. She decided upon very little. A blanket, a sack of bread and meat, and a canteen of water. She might need a weapon also. There was only one, the gun with which she had killed Kells. It seemed utterly impossible to touch that hateful thing. But now that she had liberated herself, and at such cost, she must not yield to sentiment. Resolutely, she started for the cabin. But when she reached it, her steps were dragging. The long, dull blue gun lay where she had dropped it, and out of the tail of averted eyes she saw a huddled shape along the wall. It was a sickening moment, when she reached the shaking hand for the gun, and at that instant a low moan transfixed her. She seemed frozen rigid. Was the place already haunted? Her heart swelled in her throat, and a dimness came before her eyes. But another moan brought a swift realization. Kells was alive. And the cold, clamping sickness, the strangle in her throat, all the feelings of terror, changed and were lost in a flood of instinctive joy. He was not dead. She had not killed him. She did not have blood on her hands. She was not a murderer. She whirled to look at him. There he lay, ghastly as a corpse, and all her woman's gladness fled. But there was compassion left to her, and, forgetting all else, she knelt beside him. He was as cold as stone. She felt no stir, no beat of pulse in temple or wrist. Then she placed her ear against his breast. His heart beat weakly. He's alive, she whispered, but he's dying. What shall I do? Many thoughts flashed across her mind. She could not help him now. He would be dead soon. She did not need to wait there beside him. There was a risk of some of his comrades riding into the rendezvous. Suppose his back was not broken after all. Suppose she had stopped the flow of blood, tending him, nursed him, saved his life. For if there were one chance of his living, which she doubted, it must be through her. Would he not be the same savage the hour he was well and strong again? What difference could she make in such a nature? The man was evil. He could not conquer evil. She had been witness to that. He had driven Roberts to draw and had killed him. No doubt. He had deliberately and coldly murdered the two ruffians, Bill and Holloway. Just so he could be free of their glances at her and be alone with her. He deserved to die there like a dog. What Joan Randall did was surely a woman's choice. Carefully, she rolled Kells over. The back of his vest and shirt was wet with blood. She got up to find a knife, towel, and water. As she returned to the cabin, he moaned again. Joan had dressed many a wound. She was not afraid of blood. 
The difference was that she had shed it. She felt sick, but her hands were firm as she cut open the vest and shirt, rolled them aside, and bathed his back. The big bullet had made a gaping wound, having apparently gone through the small of his back. The blood still flowed. She could not tell whether or not Kell's spine was broken, but she believed that the bullet had gone between bone and muscle or had glanced. There was a blue welt just over his spine, in line with the course of the wound. She tore her scarf into strips and used it for compresses and bandages. Then she laid him back upon a saddle blanket. She had done all that was possible for the present, and it gave her a strange sense of comfort. She even prayed for his life and, if that must go, for his soul. Then she got up. He was unconscious, white, death-like. It seemed that his torture, his near approach to death, had robbed his face of ferocity, of ruthlessness, and of that strange amiable expression. But then his eyes, those furnace windows, were closed. Joan waited for the end to come. The afternoon passed, and she did not leave the cabin. It was possible that he might come to and want water. She had once administered to a miner who had been fatally crushed in an avalanche, and never could forget his husky call for water and the gratitude in his eyes. Sunset, twilight, and night fell upon the canyon, and she began to feel solitude as something tangible. Bringing saddle and blankets into the cabin, she made a bed just inside, and facing the opening and the stars, she lay down to rest, if not sleep. The darkness did not keep her from seeing the prostrate figure of Kells. He lay there as silent as if he were already dead. She was exhausted, weary for sleep, and unstrung. In the night her courage fled, and she was frightened at shadows. The murmuring of insects seemed augmented into a roar. The morn of wolf and scream of cougar made her start. The rising wind moaned like a lost spirit. Dark fancies beset her. Troop on troop of specters, moving out of the black night, assembling there, waiting for Kells to join them. She thought she was riding homeward, over the back trail, sure of her way, remembering every rod of that rough travel, until she got out of the mountains, only to be turned back by dead men. Then fancy and dream, and all that haunted gloom of canyon and cabin, seemed slowly to merge into one immense blackness. The sun, rimming the east wall, shining into Joan's face, awakened her. She had slept hours. She felt rested stronger. Like the night, something dark had passed away from her. It did not seem strange to her that she should feel that Kells still lived. She knew it. An examination proved her right. In him, there had been no change except that he had ceased to bleed. There was just a flickering of life in him, manifest only in his slow, faint heartbeats. Joan spent most of that day in sitting beside Kells. The whole day seemed only an hour. Sometimes she would look down the canyon trail, half expecting to see horsemen riding up. If any of Kells's comrades happened to come, what could she tell them? They would be as bad as he, without that one trait which had kept him human for a day. Joan pondered upon this. It would never do to let them suspect she had shot Kells. So carefully cleaning the gun, she reloaded it. If any men came, she would tell them that Bill had done the shooting. Kells lingered. Joan began to feel that he would live, though everything indicated the contrary. Her intelligence told her he would die, and her feelings said he would not. At times, she lifted his head and got water into his mouth with a spoon. When she did this, he would moan. That night, during the hours she lay awake, she gathered courage out of the very solitude and loneliness. She had nothing to fear unless someone came to the canyon. The next day, it no wise differed from the preceding. And then, 
there came the third day, with no change in Kells till near evening, when she thought he was returning to consciousness. But she must have been mistaken. For hours she watched patiently. He might return to consciousness just before the end, and want to speak, to send a message, to ask a prayer, to feel a human hand at the last. That night the crescent moon hung over the canyon. In the faint light, Joan could see the blanched face of Kells, strange and sad, no longer seeming evil. The time came when his lips stirred. He tried to talk. She moistened his lips and gave him a drink. He murmured incoherently, sank again into a stupor, to rouse once more and babble like a madman. Then he lay quietly for long, so long that sleep was claiming Joan. Suddenly he startled her by calling very faintly but distinctly, Water! Water! Joan bent over him, lifting his head, helping him to drink. She could see his eyes, like dark holes in something white. Is that you, mother? he whispered. Yes, replied Joan. He sank immediately into another stupor or sleep, from which he did not rouse. The whisper of his mother touched Joan. Bad men had mothers, just the same as any other kind of men. Even this Kells had a mother. He was still a young man. He had been youth, boy, child, baby. Some mother had loved him, cradled him, kissed his rosy baby hands, watched him grow with pride and glory, built castles in her dreams of his manhood, and perhaps prayed for him still, trusting he was strong and honored among men. And here he lay, a shattered wreck, dying for a wicked act, the last of many crimes. It was a tragedy. It made Joan think of the hard lot of mothers. And then of this unsettled western wild, where men flocked in pack like wolves and spilled blood like water and held life nothing. Joan sought her rest and soon slept. In the morning, she did not at once go to Kells. Somehow, she dreaded finding him conscious, almost as much as she dreaded the thought of finding him dead. When she did bend over him, he was awake, and at sight of her, he showed a faint amaze. Joan, he whispered. Yes, she replied. Are you with me still? Of course, I couldn't leave you. The pale eyes shadowed strangely, darkly. I'm alive yet, and you stayed. Was it yesterday you threw my gun on me? No, four days ago. Four? Is my back broken? I don't know. I don't think so. It's a terrible wound. I, I did all I could. You tried to kill me, then tried to save me? She was silent to that. You're good, and you've been noble, he said, but I wish you'd only been bad. Then I'd curse you and strangle you presently. Perhaps you best be quiet, replied Joan. No, I've been shot before. I'll get over this, if my back's not broken. How can we tell? I've no idea. Lift me up. But you might open your wound, protested Joan. Lift me up. The force of the man spoke even in his low whisper. But why, why, asked Joan. I want to see if I can sit up. If I can't, give me my gun. I won't let you have it, replied Joan. Then she slipped her arms under his and carefully, raising him to a sitting position, released her hold. I am a rank coward about pain, he gasped, with thick drops standing out on his white face. I can't stand it. But tortured or not, he sat up alone, and even had the will to bend his back. Then with a groan he fainted and fell into Joan's arms. She laid him down and worked over him for some time before she could bring him to. Then he was wan, suffering, speechless but she believed he would live and told him so. He received that with a strange smile. Later, when she came to him with broth, he drank it gratefully. I'll beat this out, he said weakly. I'll recover. My back's not broken. I'll get well. Now you bring water and food in here. Then go. Go, she echoed. Yes, don't go down the canyon. You'll be worse off. 
Take the back trail. You've got a chance to get out. Go. Leave you here? So weak you can't lift a cup? I won't. I'd rather you did. Why? Because in a few days I'll begin to mend. Then I'll grow like myself. I think. I'm afraid I loved you. It could only be hell for you. Go now, before it's too late. If you stay till I'm well, I'll never let you go. Kells, I believe it would be cowardly for me to leave you here alone, she replied earnestly. You can't help yourself. You'd die. All the better, but I won't die. I'm hard to kill. Go, I tell you. She shook her head. This is bad for you, arguing. You're excited. Please be quiet. Joan Randall, if you stay, I'll halter you. Keep you naked in a cave. Curse you. Beat you. Murder you. Oh, it's in me. Go, I tell you. You're out of your head. Once for all, no, she replied firmly. You, you... His voice failed in a terrible whisper. In the succeeding days, Kells did not often speak. His recovery was slow, a matter of doubt. Nothing was any plainer than the fact that if Joan had left him, he would not have lived long. She knew it, and he knew it. When he was awake, and she came to him, a mournful and beautiful smile lit his eyes. The sight of her apparently hurt him and uplifted him. But he slept twenty hours out of every day, and while he slept he did not need Joan. She came to know the meaning of solitude. There were days when she did not hear the sound of her own voice. A habit of silence, one of the significant forces of solitude, had grown upon her. Daily she thought less and felt more. For hours she did nothing. When she roused herself, compelled herself to think of these encompassing peaks of the lonely canyon walls, the stately trees, all those eternally silent and changeless features of her solitude, she hated them with a blind and unreasoning passion. She hated them because she was losing her love for them because they were becoming a part of her, because they were fixed and content and passionless. She liked to sit in the sun, feel its warmth, see its brightness, and sometimes she almost forgot to go back to her patient. She fought at times against an insidious change, a growing older, a going backward. At other times she drifted through hours that seemed quiet and golden, in which nothing happened. And by and by, when she realized that the drifting hours were gradually swallowing up the restless and active hours, then strangely, she remembered Jim Cleve. Memory of him came to save her. She dreamed of him during the long, lonely, solemn days, and in the dark, silent climax of unbearable solitude, the night. She remembered his kisses, forgot her anger and shame, accepted the sweetness of their meaning, and so, in the interminable hours of her solitude, she dreamed herself into love for him. Joan kept some record of days, until three weeks or thereabout passed, and then she lost track of time. It dragged along, yet looked at as the past. It seemed to have sped swiftly. The change in her, the growing old, the revelation and responsibility of Surf as a woman, made this experience appear to have extended over months. Kell slowly became convalescent, and then he had a relapse. Something happened, the nature of which Joan could not tell, and he almost died. There were days when his life hung in the balance, when he could not talk, and then came a perceptible turn for the better. The store of provisions grew low, and Joan began to face another serious situation. Deer and rabbit were plentiful in the canyon, but she could not kill one with a revolver. She thought she would be forced to sacrifice one of the horses. The fact that Kell suddenly showed a craving for meat brought this aspect of the situation to a climax. And that very morning, while Joan was pondering the matter, she saw a number of horsemen riding up the canyon toward the cabin. At the moment she was relieved and experienced nothing of the dread she had formerly felt while anticipating this very event. Kells, she said quickly, 
There are men riding up the trail. Good, he exclaimed weakly, with a light on his drawn face. They've been long in getting here. How many? Joan counted them, five riders and several pack animals. Yes, it's Golden. Golden, cried Joan with a start. Her exclamation and tone made Kells regard her attentively. You've heard of him. He's the toughest nut on this border. I never saw his like. You won't be safe. I'm so helpless. What to say to tell him? Joan, if I should happen to croak, you want to get away quick or shoot yourself. How strange to hear this bandit warn her of a peril the like of which she had encountered through him. Joan secured the gun and hid it in a niche between the logs. Then she looked out again. The riders were close at hand now. The foremost one, a man of Herculean build, jumped his mount across the brook and leaped off while he hauled the horse to a stop. The second rider came close behind him. The others approached leisurely with the gait of the pack animals. Ho, oh, Kells, called the big man. His voice had a loud, bold, sonorous kind of ring. Reckon he's here somewheres, said the other man presently. Sure, I seen his horse. Jack ain't going to be far from that horse. Then both of them approached the cabin. Joan had never before seen two such striking, vicious-looking, awesome men. The one was huge, so wide and heavy and deep-set, that he looked short and he resembled a gorilla. The other was tall, slim, with a face as red as flame, and an expression of fierce keenness. He was stoop-shouldered, yet he held his head erect in a manner that suggested a wolf scenting blood. "'Someone here, Pierce,' boomed the big man. "'Why, gull, if it ain't a girl!' Joan moved out of the shadow of the wall of the cabin, and she pointed to the prostrate figure on the blankets. "'Howdy, boys,' said Kells, wanly. Golden cursed in amaze, while Pierce dropped to his knee with an exclamation of concern. They both began to talk at once. Kells interrupted them by lifting a weak hand. No, I'm not going to cash, he said. I'm only starved and in need of stimulants. Had my back half shot off. Who plugged you, Jack? Golden, it was your side partner, Bill. Bill? Golden's voice held a queer, coarse constraint. Then he added gruffly, thought you and him pulled together. Well, we didn't. And where's Bill now? This time Joan heard a slow, curious, cold note in the heavy voice, and she interpreted it as either doubt or deceit. Bill's dead in Holloway, too, replied Kells. Golden turned his massive, shaggy head in the direction of Joan. She had not the courage to meet the gaze upon her. The other man spoke. Split over the girl, Jack? No, replied Kells sharply. They tried to get familiar with my wife and I shot them both. Joan felt a swift leap of hot blood all over her, and then a coldness, a sickening, a hateful weakness. Wife, ejaculated Golden. Your real wife, Jack, queried Pierce. Well, I guess I'll introduce you. Joan, here are two of my friends, Sam Golden and Red Pierce. Golden grunted something. Mrs. Kells, I'm glad to meet you, said Pierce. Just then the other three men entered the cabin, and Joan took advantage of the commotion they made to get out into the air. She felt sick, frightened, and yet terribly enraged. She staggered a little as she went out, and she knew she was pale as death. These visitors thrust reality upon her with a cruel suddenness. There was something terrible in the mere presence of this golden. She had not yet dared to take a good look at him. But what she felt was overwhelming. She wanted to run, yet escape was now infinitely more of a menace than before. If she slipped away, it would be these new enemies who would pursue her, track her like hounds. She understood why Kells had introduced her as his wife. She hated the idea with a shameful and burning hate. But a moment's reflection taught her that Kells had answered once more to a good instinct. At the moment he had meant that to protect her. 
A further reflection persuaded Joan that she would be wise to act naturally and to carry out the deception as far as it was possible for her. It was her only hope. Her position had again grown perilous. She thought of the gun she had secreted, and it gave her strength to control her agitation and return to the cabin outwardly calm. The man at Kells half turned over with the flesh of his back exposed. Ah, oh, gall, it's whiskey he needs, said one. If you let out any more blood, he'll croak, sure, protested another. Look how weak he is, said Red Pierce. It's a hell of a lot you know, roared Golden. I served my time, but that's none of your business. Look here. See that blue spot? Golden pressed a huge finger down upon the blue welt on Kells's back. The bandit moaned. That's lead. That's the bullet, declared Golden. Well, if you ain't correct, exclaimed Pierce. Kells turned his head. When you punched that place, it made me numb all over. Gull, if you've located the bullet, cut it out. Joan did not watch the operation. As she went away to the seat under the balsam, she heard a sharp cry and then cheers. Evidently the grim Golden had been both swift and successful. Presently the men came out of the cabin and began to attend to their horses and the pack train. Pierce looked for Joan, and upon seeing her he called out, Kells wants you. Joan found a bandit half propped up against a saddle with a damp and pallid face, but an altogether different look. Joan, that bullet was pressing on my spine, he said. Now it's out. All that deadness is gone. I feel alive. I'll get well soon. Golden was curious over the bullet. It's a forty-four caliber, and neither Bill Bailey nor Holloway used that caliber of gun. Golden remembered. He's cunning. Bill was as near being a friend to this Golden as any man I know of. I can't trust any of these men, particularly Golden. You stay pretty close by me. Kells, you'll let me go soon? Help me get home, implored Joan in a low voice. Girl, it'd never be safe now, he replied. Then later, soon, when it is safe. We'll see, but you're my wife now. With the latter words, the man subtly changed. Something of the power she had felt in him before his illness began again to be manifested. Joan divined that these comrades had caused a difference in him. You won't dare. Joan was unable to conclude her meaning. A tight band compressed her breast and throat, and she trembled. Will you dare go out there and tell them you're not my wife? he queried. His voice had grown stronger, and his eyes were blending shadows of thought. Joan knew that she dared not. She must choose the lesser of two evils. No man could be such a beast to a woman after she saved his life, she whispered. I could be anything. You had your chance. I told you to go. I said if I ever got well, I'd be as I was before. But you'd have died. That would have been better for you, Joan. I'll do this. Marry you honestly and leave the country. I've gold. I'm young. I love you. I intend to have you. And I'll begin life over again. What do you say? Say? I'd die before I'd marry you, she panted. All right, Joan Randall, he replied bitterly for a moment. I saw a ghost. My old dead better self. It's gone, and you stay with me. End of chapter 6「This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After dark, Kells had his men build a fire before the open side of the cabin. He lay propped up on blankets and his saddle, while the others lounged or sat in a half-circle in the light facing him. Joan drew her blanket into a corner where the shadows were thick and she could see without being seen. She wondered how she would ever sleep near all these wild men, if she could ever sleep again. Yet she seemed more curious and wakeful than frightened. She had no way to explain it, but she felt the fact that her presence in the camp had a subtle influence. 
at once restraining and exciting. So she looked out upon the scene with wide open eyes. And she received more strongly than ever an impression of wildness. Even the campfire seemed to burn wildly. It did not glow and sputter and pale and brighten and sing like an honest campfire. It blazed in red, fierce, hurried flames, wild to consume the logs. It cast a baleful and sinister color upon the hard faces there. Then the blackness of the enveloping night was pitchy, without any bold outline of canyon wall or companionship of stars. The coyotes were out in force, and from all around came their wild, sharp barks. The wind rose and mourned weirdly through the balsams. But it was in the men that Joan felt mostly that element of wildness. Kells lay with his ghastly face clear in the play of the moving flare of light. It was an intelligent, keen, strong face, but evil. Evil power stood out in the lines, in the strange eyes, stranger than ever, now in shadow. And it seemed once more the face of an alert, listening, implacable man, with wild projects in mind, driving him to the doom he meant for others. Pierce's red face shone redder in that ruddy light. It was hard, lean, almost fleshless, a red mask stretched over a grinning skull. The one they called Frenchy was little, dark, small-featured, with piercing, gimlet-like eyes, and a mouth ready to gush forth hate and violence. The next two were not particularly individualized by any striking aspect, merely looking border ruffians after the type of Bill and Holloway. But Golden, who sat at the end of the half-circle, was an object that Joan could scarcely bring her gaze to study. Somehow her first glance at him put into her mind a strange idea, that she was a woman, and therefore, of all creatures or things in the world, the farthest removed from him. She looked away and found her gaze returning, fascinated, as if she were a bird and he a snake. The man was of huge frame, a giant whose every move suggested the acme of physical power. He was an animal, a gorilla, with a shock of light instead of black hair, of pale instead of black skin. His features might have been hewn and hammered out with coarse, dull, broken chisels. And upon his face, in the lines and cords, in the huge caverns where his eyes hid, and in the huge gash that held strong white fangs, had been stamped by nature and by life a terrible ferocity. Here was a man, or a monster, in whose presence Joan felt she would rather be dead. He did not smoke, he did not indulge in the coarse, good-natured raillery. He sat there like a huge engine of destruction that needed no rest, but was forced to rest because of weaker attachments. On the other hand, he was not sullen or brooding. It was that he did not seem to think. Kells had been rapidly gaining strength since the extraction of the bullet, and it was evident that his interest was growing proportionately. He asked questions and received most of his replies from Red Pierce. Joan did not listen attentively at first, but presently she regretted that she had not. She gathered that Kells's fame as the master bandit of the whole gold region of Idaho, Nevada, and northeastern California was a fame that he loved as much as the gold he stole. Joan sensed, through these replies of these men and their attitude toward Kells, that his power was supreme. He ruled the robbers and ruffians of his bands, and evidently they were scattered from Bannock to Lewiston and all along the border. He had power, likewise, over the border hawks not directly under his leadership. During the weeks of his enforced stay in the canyon, there had been a cessation of operations, the nature of which Joan merely guessed, and a gradual accumulation of idle wailing men in the main camp. Also she gathered, but vaguely, that though Kells had supreme power, the organization he desired was yet far from being consummated. 
he showed thoughtfulness and irritation by turns, and it was the subject of gold that drew his intensest interest. "'Reckon you'd figure right, Jack,' said Red Pierce, and paused as if before a long talk while he refilled his pipe. "'Sooner or later there'll be the biggest gold strike ever made in the West. Wagon trains are met every day, coming from across Salt Lake. Prospectors are working in hordes down from Bannock. All the gulches and valleys in the Bear Mountains have their camps. Surface gold everywhere and easy to get where there's water. But there's digging all over. No big strike yet. It's bound to come sooner or later. And then, when the news hits the main traveled roads and reaches back into the mountains, there's going to be a rush that'll make 49 and 51 look sick. What do you say, Bate? Sure will, replied a grizzled individual whom Kells had called Bate Wood. He was not so young as his companions, more sober, less wild, and slower of speech. I saw both 49 and 51. Them was days. But I'm agreeing with Red. There sure will be hell on this Idaho border sooner or later. I've been a prospector, though I never hankered after the hard work of digging gold. Gold is hard to dig, easy to lose, and easy to get from some other fellow. I see the signs of a coming strike somewhere in this region. Maybe it's on now. There's thousands of prospectors in twos and threes and groups out in the hills all over. They ain't going to tell when they do make a strike, but gold must be brought out. And gold is heavy. It ain't easy to hide. That's how strikes are discovered. I sure reckon that this year will beat 49 and 51. And for two reasons. There's a steady stream of broken and disappointed gold seekers back trailing from California. There's a bigger stream of hopeful and crazy fortune hunters traveling in from the east. Then there's the women and the gamblers and such that hang on. And last, the men that the war is driving out here. Whenever and wherever these streams meet, if there is a big gold strike, there'll be the hellish time the world ever saw. Boys, said Kells, with a ring in his weak voice, it'll be a harvest for my border legion. For what? queried Batewood curiously. All the others except Golden turned inquiring and interested faces toward the bandit. The border legion, replied Kells. And what's that? asked Red Pierce bluntly. Well, if the time's ripe for the great gold fever you say is coming, then it's ripe for the greatest band ever organized. I'll organize. I'll call it the Border Legion. Count me in his right hand, pard, said Red with enthusiasm. And sure me, boss, added Batewood. The idea was received vociferously, at which demonstration the giant Golden raised his massive head and asked, or rather growled, in a heavy voice what the fuss was about. His query, his roused presence, seemed to act upon the others, even Kells, with a strange disquieting or halting force, as if here it was a character or an obstacle to be considered. After a moment of silence, Red Pierce explained the project. Huh, nothing new in that, replied Golden. I belonged to one once. It was in Algiers. They called it the Royal Legion. Algiers? What's that? asked Batewood. Africa, replied Golden. Say, Gull, you've been around some, said Red Pierce, admiringly. What was the Royal Legion? Nothing but a lot of devils from all over. The border there was the last place. Every criminal was safe from pursuit. What'd you do? Fought among ourselves. Wasn't many in the Legion when I left. Sure, that ain't strange, exclaimed Wood significantly. But his inference was lost upon Golden. I won't allow any fighting in my Legion, said Kells coolly. I'll pick this band myself. That's the secret, rejoined Wood. The right fellows. I've been in all kinds of bands. Why, I even was a vigilante in 51. That elicited a laugh from his fellows, except the wooden-faced Golden. How many do we want? asked Red Pierce. The number doesn't matter, but they must be men I can trust and control. Them as lieutenants, I'll need a few young fellows, like you, Red. Nervy, 
daring, cool, quick of wits. Red Pierce enjoyed the praise bestowed upon him and gave his shoulders a swagger. Speaking of that, boss, he said, reminds me of a chap who rode into Cabin Gulch a few weeks ago. Braced right into Beard's place, where we were all playing faro, and he asked for Jack Kells. Right off, we all thought he was a guy who had a grievance, and some of us was for plugging him. But I kind of liked him, and I cooled the gang down. Glad I did that. He wasn't wanting to throw a gun. His intentions were friendly. Of course, I didn't show curious about who or what he was. Reckon he was a young fellow who had gone bad sudden-like and was hunting friends, and I'm here to say, boss, that he was wild. What's his name? asked Kells. Jim Cleve, he said, replied Pierce. Joan Randall, hidden back in the shadows, forgotten or ignored by this bandit group, heard the name Jim Cleve with pain and fear, but not amaze. From the moment Pierce began his speech, she had been prepared for the revelation of her runaway lover's name. She trembled and grew a little sick. Jim had made no idle threat. What she would have given to live over again, the moment that had alienated him. Jim cleaved, mused Kells. Never heard of him, and I never forget a name or a face. What's he like? Clean, rangy chap, big, but not too big, replied Pierce. All muscle, no more than twenty-three. Hard rider, hard fighter, hard gambler and drinker, reckless as hell. If only you can steady him, boss. Ask Bates what he thinks. Well, exclaimed Kells in surprise, strangers are everyday occurrences on this border. But I never knew one to impress you fellows as this Cleve. Bate, what do you say? What's this Cleve done? You're an old head. Talk sense now. Done, echoed Wood, scratching his grizzled head. What in the hell ain't he done? He rode in brazener than any fella that ever stacked up against this outfit. And straight off he wins the outfit. I don't know how he done it. Maybe it was because, you seen, he didn't care for anything or anybody on earth. He stirred us up. He won all the money we had in camp, broke most of us, and give it all back. He drank more than the whole outfit, yet didn't get drunk. He threw his gun on Beatty Jones for cheating, and then on Beatty's pard, Chick Williams. Didn't shoot to kill, just winged him. But say, he's the quickest and smoothest hand to throw a gun that ever hit this border. Don't overlook that, Kells. This Jim Cleves, a great youngster, going bad quick. And I'm here to add that he'll take some company along. Bate, you forgot to tell how he handled loose, said Red Pierce. You was there, I wasn't. Tell Kells that. Luce, I know the man. Go ahead, Bate, responded Kells. Maybe it ain't any recommendation for said Jim Cleve, replied Wood, though it did sort of warm me to him. Boss, of course. You recollect that little Brander girl over at Bear Lake Village? She's old Brander's girl, worked in a store there. I've seen you talk sweet to her myself. Well, it seems the old man and some of his boys took to prospecting and fetched the girl along. That's how I understood it. Luce came bracing in over Cabin Gulch one day. As usual, he was drinking and playing. But young Cleve wasn't doing neither. He had a strange, moody spell that day, as I recollect. Luce sprung a job on us. We never worked with him or his outfit, but maybe you can't tell what'd come off if it hadn't been for Cleve. Luce had a job put up to ride down where old Brander was washing for gold and take what he had and the girl. Fact was the gold was only incidental. When somebody cornered Luce, he couldn't swear that there was gold worth going after. And about then Jim Cleve woke up. He cussed Luce something fearful. And when Luce went for his gun, natural-like, why this Jim Cleve took it away from him. And then he jumped Luce. He knocked and threw him around and near beat him to death before we could interfere. Luce was sure near dead, all battered up, broken bones, and what all, I can't say. We put him to bed, and he's there yet, and he'll never be the same man he was. A significant silence fell upon the group 
at the conclusion of Wood's narrative. Woods had liked the telling, and it made his listeners thoughtful. All at once the pale face of Kells turned slightly towards Golden. "'Golden, did you hear that?' asked Kells. "'Yes,' replied the man. "'What do you think about this Jim Cleve and the job he prevented?' "'Never saw Cleve. I'll look him up when we get back to camp. Then I'll go after the Brander girl.' How strange his brutal assurance marked the line between him and his companions. There was something wrong, something perverse in this Golden. Had Kells meant to bring that point out, or to get an impression of Cleve? Joan could not decide. She divined that there was antagonism between Golden and all the others, and there was something else, vague and intangible, that might have been fear. Apparently Golden was a criminal for the sake of crime. Joan regarded him with a growing terror, augmented the more because he alone kept eyes upon the corner where she was hidden and she felt that compared with him, the others, even Kells, of whose cold villainy she was assured, were but insignificant men of evil. She covered her head with a blanket to shut out the sight of that shaggy, massive head and the great dark caves of eyes. Thereupon Joan did not see or hear any more of the bandits. Evidently the conversation died down, or she, in the absorption of new thoughts, no longer heard. She relaxed, and suddenly seemed to quiver all over, with the name she whispered to herself. Jim, Jim, oh, Jim! And the last whisper was an inward sob. What he had done was terrible. It tortured her. She had not believed it in him. Yet, now she thought, how like him. All for her, in despair and spite, he had ruined himself. He would be killed out there in some drunken brawl, or still worse, he would become a member of this bandit crew and drift in the crime. That was a great blow to Joan, that the curse should put upon him. How silly, false, and vain had been her coquetry, her indifference. She loved Jim Cleve. She had not known that when she started out to trail him, to fetch him back, but she knew it now. She ought to have known before. The situation she had foreseen loomed dark and monstrous and terrible in prospect. Just to think of it made her body creep and shudder with cold terror. Yet there was that strange, inward, thrilling burn round her heart. Somewhere, and soon, she was coming face to face with this changed Jim Cleve, this boy who had become a reckless devil. What would he do? What could she do? Might he not despise her, scorn her, curse her, taking her at Kell's words? the wife of a bandit. But no, he would divine the truth in the flash of an eye. And then? She could not think what might happen, but it must mean blood death. If he escaped Kells's, how could he ever escape this golden, this huge vulture of prey? Still, with the horror thick upon her, Joan could not wholly give up. The moment Jim Cleve's name and his ruin burst upon her ears in the gossip of these bandits, she had become another girl, a girl wholly become a woman, and one with a driving passion to save if it cost her life. She lost her fear of Kells, of the others, of all except Golden. He was not human, and instinctively she knew she could do nothing with him. She might influence the others, but never Golden. The torment in her brain eased in, and gradually she quieted down, with only a pang and a weight in her breast. The past seemed far away, the present was nothing. Only the future that contained Jim Cleve mattered to her. She would not have left the clutches of Kells if at that moment she could have walked forth free and safe. She was going on to Cabin Gulch, and that thought was the last one in her weary mind as she dropped to sleep. End of chapter 7
he thought that he had gained sufficiently to undertake the journey to the main camp, Cabin Gulch. He was eager to get back there, and imperious in his overruling of any opposition. The men could take turns at propping him in a saddle. So on the morning of the fourth day, they packed for the ride. During these few days, Joan had verified her suspicion that Kells had two sides to his character, or it seemed rather that her presence developed a latent or a long-dead side. When she was with him, thereby distracting his attention, he was entirely different from what he was when his men surrounded him. Apparently he had no knowledge of this. He showed surprise and gratitude at Joan's kindness, though never pity or compassion for her. That he had become infatuated with her, Joan could no longer doubt. His strange eyes followed her. There was a dreamy light in them. He was mostly silent with her. Before those few days had come to an end, he had developed two things, a reluctance to let Joan leave his sight, and an intolerance of the presence of the other men, particularly Golden. Always Joan felt the eyes of these men upon her, mostly in unobtrusive glances, except Golden's. The giant studied her with slow, cavernous stare, without curiosity or speculation or admiration. Evidently a woman was a new and strange creature to him, and he was experiencing unfamiliar sensations. Whenever Joan accidentally met his gaze, for she avoided it as much as possible, she shuddered with sick memory of a story she had heard, how a huge and ferocious gorilla had stolen into an African village and run off with a white woman. She could not shake the memory, and it was this that made her kinder to Kells than otherwise would have been possible. All Joan's faculties sharpened in this period. She felt her own development, the beginning of a bitter and hard education, an instinctive assimilation of all that nature taught its wild people and creatures. The first thing in elemental life, self-preservation. Parallel in her heart and mind ran a hopeless despair and a driving, unquenchable spirit. The former was fear, the latter love. She believed beyond a doubt that she had doomed herself along with Jim Cleve. She felt that she had the courage, the power, the love to save him, if not herself. And the reason that she did not falter and fail in this terrible situation was because her despair, great as it was, did not equal her love. That morning, before being lifted upon his horse, Kells buckled on his gun belt. The sheath and full round of shells and the gun made this belt a burden for a weak man, and so Red Pierce insisted. But Kells laughed in his face. The men, always excepting Golden, were unfailing in kindness and care. Apparently, they would have fought for Kells to the death. They were simple and direct in their rough feelings. But in Kells, Joan thought, was a character who was a product of this border wildness, yet one who could stand aloof from himself and see the possibilities, the unexpected, the meaning of that life. Kells knew that a man, and yet another, might show kindness and faithfulness one moment, but the very next, out of a manhood retrograde to the savage, out of a circumstance or chance, might respond to a primitive force far sunderer from thought or reason, and rise to unbridled action. Joan divined that Kells buckled on his gun to be ready to protect her, but his men never dreamed his motive. Kells was a strong, bad man, set among men like him, yet he was infinitely different because he had brains. On the start of the journey, Joan was instructed to ride before Kells and Pierce, who supported the leader in his saddle. The pack drivers and Batewood and Frenchy rode ahead. Golden held to the rear, and this order was preserved till noon, when the cavalcade halted for a rest in a shady, grassy, and well-watered nook. Kells was haggard, and his brow wet with clammy dew, and lined with pain, yet he was cheerful and patient. Still, he hurried the men through their tasks. 
In an hour the afternoon travel was begun. The canyon and its surroundings grew more rugged and of larger dimensions. Yet the trail appeared to get broader and better all the time. Joan noticed intersecting trails running down from side canyons and gulches. The descent was gradual and scarcely evident in any way, except in the running water and warmer air. Kells, tired before the middle of the afternoon, and he would have fallen from his saddle but for the support of his fellows. One by one they held him up, and it was not easy work to ride alongside, holding him up. Joan observed that Golden did not offer his services. He seemed a part of this gang, yet not of it. Joan never lost a feeling of his presence behind her, and from time to time, when he rode closer, the feelings grew stronger. Toward the close of that afternoon, she became aware of Golden's strange attention, and when a halt was made for camp, she dreaded something nameless. This halt occurred early, before sunset, and had been necessitated by the fact that Kells was fainting. They laid him out on blankets, with his head in his saddle. Joan tended him, and he recovered somewhat, though he lacked the usual keenness. It was a busy hour, with saddles, packs, horses, with wood to cut, and fire to build, and meal to cook. Kells drank thirstily, but refused food. Joan, he whispered, at an opportune moment, I'm only tired, dead for sleep. You stay beside me, wake me quick, if you want to. He closed his eyes wearily, without explaining, and soon slumbered. Joan did not choose to allow these men to see that she feared them, or distrusted them, or disliked them. She ate with them beside the fire and this was their first opportunity to be close to her. The fact had an immediate and singular influence. Joan had no vanity, though she knew she was handsome. She forced herself to be pleasant, agreeable, even sweet. Their response was instant and growing. At first they were bold, then familiar and coarse. For years she had been used to rough men of the camps. These, however, were different, and their jokes and suggestions had no effect because they were beyond her. And when this became manifest to them, that aspect of their relation to her changed. She grasped the fact intuitively, and then she verified it by proof. Her heart beat strong and high. If she could hide her hate, her fear, her abhorrence, she could influence these wild men. But it all depended upon her charm, her strangeness, her femininity. Insensibly, they had been influenced, and it proved that in the worst of men there yet survived some good. Golden alone presented a contrast and a problem. He appeared aware of her presence while he sat there eating like a wolf, but it was as if she were only an object. The man watched as might have an animal. Her experience at the campfire meal inclined her to the belief that, if there were such a possibility as her being safe at all, it would be owing to an unconscious and friendly attitude toward the companions she had been forced to accept. Those men were pleased, stirred at being in her vicinity. Joan came to a melancholy and fearful cognizance of her attraction. While at home she seldom had borne upon her a reality that she was a woman, her place, her person, were merely natural. Here it was all different, to these wild men, developed by loneliness, fierce-blooded, with pulses like whips, a woman was something that thrilled, charmed, soothed, that incited a strange, insatiable, inexplicable hunger for the very sight of her. They did not realize it, but Joan did. Presently Joan finished her supper and said, I'll go hobble my horse. He strays sometimes. Sure, I'll go, miss, said Batewood. He had never called her Mrs. Kells, but Joan believed he had not thought of the significance. Hardened old ruffian that he was, Joan regarded him as the best of a bad lot. He had lived long, and some of his life had not been bad. Let me go, added Pierce. No, thank you, I'll go myself, she replied. She took the rope, hobble, off her saddle, 
and boldly swung down the trail. Suddenly she heard two or more of the men speak at once, and then, low and clear, Golden, where in the hell are you going? This was Red Pierce's voice. Joan glanced back. Golden had started down the trail after her. Her heart quaked, her knees shook, and she was ready to run back. Golden halted, then turned away, growling. He acted as if caught in something surprising to himself. We're on to you, Golden, continued Pierce, deliberately. Be careful, or we'll put Kells on. A booming, angry curse was the response. The men grouped closer, and a loud altercation followed. Joan almost ran down the trail and heard no more. If any one of them had started her way now, she would have plunged into the thickets like a frightened deer. Evidently, however, they meant to let her alone. Joan found her horse, and before hobbling him, she was assailed by a temptation to mount him and ride away. This she did not want to do, and would not do under any circumstances. Still, she could not prevent the natural instinctive impulse of a woman. She crossed to the other side of the brook and returned towards camp under the spruce and balsam trees. She did not hurry. It was good to be alone, out of sight of those violent men, away from that constant wearing physical proof of catastrophe. Nevertheless, she did not feel free or safe for a moment. She peered fearfully into the shadows of the rocks and the trees, and presently it was a relief to get back to the side of the sleeping Kells. He lay in a deep slumber of exhaustion. She arranged her own saddle and blankets near him, and prepared to meet the night as best she could. Instinctively, she took a position where in one swift snatch she could get possession of Kells's gun. It was about time of sunset, warm and still in the canyon, with rosy light fading upon the peaks. The men were all busy with one thing or another. Strange it was to see Golden, who Joan thought might be a shirker, did twice the work of any man, especially the heavy work. He seemed to enjoy carrying a log that would have overweighed two ordinary men. He was so huge, so active, so powerful, that it was fascinating to watch him. They built a campfire for the night, uncomfortably near Joan's position. However, remembering how cold the air would become later, she made no objection. Twilight set in, and the men, through for the day, gathered near the fire. Then Joan was not long in discovering that the situation had begun to impinge upon the feeling of each of these men. They looked at her differently. Some of them invented pretexts to approach her, to ask something, to offer service, anything, to get near her. A personal and individual note had been injected into the attitude of each. Intuitively, Joan guessed that Golden's arising to follow her had turned their eyes inward. Golden remained silent and inactive at the edge of the campfire circle of light which flickered fitfully around him, making him seem a huge, gloomy ape of a man. So far as Joan could tell, Golden never cast his eyes in her direction. That was a difference which left cause for reflection. Had that hulk of brawn and bone begun to think? Batewood's overtures to Joan were rough, but inexplicable to her because she dared not wholly trust him. And sure, miss, he had concluded in a hoarse whisper, we all know you ain't Kells's wife. That bandit wouldn't marry no woman. He's a woman-hater. He was famous for that over in California. He's run off with you, kidnapped you, that's sure. And Golden swears he shot his own men and was in turn shot by you. That bullet hole in his back was full of powder. There's liable to be a muss-up any time. Sure, miss. You'd better sneak off with me tonight when they're all asleep. I'll get grub and horses and take you off to some prospector's camp. Then you can get home. Joan only shook her head. Even if she could have felt trust in Wood, and she was of half a mind to believe him, it was too late. Whatever befell her mattered little if in suffering she could save Jim Cleve from the ruin she had wrought. 
Since this wild experience of Joan's had begun, she had been sick so many times, with raw and naked emotions hitherto unknown to her, that she believed she could not feel another new fear or torture. But these strange sensations grew by what they had been fed upon. The man called Frenchy was audacious, persistent, smiling, amorous-eyed, and rudely gallant. He cared no more for his companions than if they had not been there. He vied with Pierce in his attention, and the two of them discomfited the others. The situation might have been amusing, had it not been so terrible. Always the portent was a shadow behind their interest and amiability and jealousy. Except for that one abrupt and sinister move of Golden's, that of a natural man beyond deceit, there was no word, no look, no act at which Joan could have been offended. They were joking, sarcastic, ironical, and sullen in their relation to each other. But to Joan each one presented what was naturally, or what he considered his kindest and most friendly front. A young and attractive woman had dropped into the camp of lonely wild men, and in their wild hearts was a rebirth of egotism, vanity, hunger for notice. They seemed as foolish as a lot of cock-grouse preening themselves and parading before a single female. Surely in some heart was born real brotherhood for a helpless girl in peril. Inevitably in some of them would burst a flame of passion as it had in Kells. Between this amiable contest for Joan's glances and replies, with its possibility of latent good to her, and the dark, lurking, unspoken meaning, such as lay in Golden's brooding, Joan found another new and sickening torture. "'Say, Frenchy, you're no ladies' man,' declared Red Pierce. "'And you, Bate, you're too old. Move, pass by, sachet.' Pierce good-naturedly, but deliberately, pushed the two men back. "'Sure she's Kell's lady, ain't she?' drawled Wood. "'Ain't you all forgetting that?' Kells is asleep or dead, replied Pierce, and he succeeded in getting the field to himself. Where'd you meet Kells anyway? he asked Joan, with his red face bending near hers. Joan had her part to play. It was difficult because she divined Pierce's curiosity held a trap to catch her in a falsehood. He knew, they all knew, she was not Kells' wife. But if she were a prisoner, she seemed a willing and contented one. The query that breathed in Pierce's presence was how was he to reconcile the fact of her submission with what he and his comrades had potently felt as her goodness. "'That doesn't concern anybody,' replied Joan. "'Reckon not,' said Pierce. Then he leaned nearer with intense face. "'What I want to know is golden right. Did you shoot Kells?' In the dusk, Joan reached back and clasped Kell's hand. For a man as weak and weary as he had been, it was remarkable how quickly a touch awakened him. He lifted his head. "'Hello, who's that?' he called out sharply. Pierce rose guardedly, startled but not confused. "'It's only me, boss,' he replied. "'I was about to turn in, and I wanted to know how you are, if I could do anything.' I'm all right, Red, replied Kells coolly. Clear out and let me alone, all of you. Pierce moved away with an amiable good night and joined the others at the campfire. Presently they sought their blankets, leaving Golden hunching there, silent in the gloom. Joan, why did you wake me? whispered Kells. Pierce asked me if I shot you, replied Joan. I woke you instead of answering him. He did, exclaimed Kells under his breath. Then he laughed. Can't fool that gang. I guess it doesn't matter. Maybe it'd be well if they knew you shot me. He appeared thoughtful and lay there with a fading flare of the fire on his pale face. But he did not speak again. Presently he fell asleep. Joan leaned back within reach of him with her head in her saddle and pulling a blanket up over her relaxed her limbs to rest. Sleep seemed the furthest thing from her. She wondered that she dared to think of it. The night had grown chilly, 
the wind was sweeping with low roar through the balsams, and the fire burned dull and red. Joan watched the black, shapeless hulk that she knew to be golden. For a long time he remained motionless. By and by he moved, approached the fire, stood one moment in the dying, ruddy glow, his great breath and bulk magnified, with all about him vague and shadowy, but the more sinister for that. The cavernous eyes were only black spaces in that vast face. Yet Joan saw them upon her. He lay down then among the other men, and soon his deep and heavy breathing denoted the tranquil slumber of an ox. For hours through changing shadows and starlight, Joan lay awake while a thousand thoughts besieged her, all centering round that vital and compelling one of Jim Cleve. Only upon awakening with the sun in her face did Joan realize that she had actually slept. The camp was bustling with activity. The horses were in, fresh and quarrelsome, with ears laid back. Kells was sitting upon a rock near the fire with a cup of coffee in his hand. He was looking better. When he greeted Joan, his voice sounded stronger. She walked by Pierce and Frenchy and Golden on her way to the brook, but they took no notice of her. Bate Wood, however, touched his sombrero and said, "'Morning, miss.' Joan wondered if her memory of the preceding night were only a bad dream. There was a different atmosphere by daylight, and it was dominated by Kells. Presently she returned to camp refreshed and hungry. Golden was throwing a pack, which action he performed with ease and dexterity. Pierce was cinching her saddle. Kells was talking, more like his old self, than any time since his injury. Soon they were on the trail. For Joan, time always passed swiftly on horseback. Movement and changing scene were pleasurable to her. The passing of time, now, held a strange expectancy, a mingled fear and hope and pain. For at the end of this trail was Jim Cleve. In other days she had flouted him, made fun of him, dominated him, everything except loved and feared him. And now she was assured of her love and almost convinced of her fear. The reputation these wild bandits gave Jim was astounding and inexplicable to Joan. She rode the miles thinking of Jim, dreading to meet him, longing to see him, and praying and planning for him. About noon, the cavalcade rode out of the mouth of a canyon into a wide valley surrounded by high, rounded foothills. Horses and cattle were grazing on the green levels. A wide, shallow, noisy stream split the valley. Joan could tell from the tracks at the crossing that this place, whatever and wherever it was, saw considerable travel, and she concluded the main rendezvous of the bandits was close at hand. The pack drivers led across the stream and the valley to enter an intersecting ravine. It was narrow, rough-sided, and floored, but the trail was good. Presently it opened into a beautiful V-shaped gulch, very different from the high-walled, shut-in canyons. It had a level floor through which a brook flowed, and clumps of spruce and pine with here and there a giant balsam. Huge patches of wildflowers gave rosy color to the grassy slopes. At the upper end of this gulch, Joan saw a number of widely separated cabins. This place, then, was Cabin Gulch. Upon reaching the first cabin, the cavalcade split up. There were men here who hallowed a welcome. Golden halted with his pack horse. Some of the others rode on. Wood drove other pack animals off to the right, up the gentle slope, and Red Pierce, who was beside Kells, instructed Joan to follow them. They rode up to a bench of straggling spruce trees, in the midst of which stood a large log cabin. It was new, as in fact all the structures in that gulch appeared to be, and none of them had seen a winter. The chinks between the logs were yet open. The cabin was of the rudest make of notched logs, one upon another, and a roof of brush and earth. It was low and flat, but very long and extending before the whole of it was a porch roof supported by posts. At one end was a corral. There were doors and windows with nothing in them. Upon the front wall, outside, 
hung saddles and bridles. Joan had a swift, sharp gaze for the men who rose from their lounging to greet the travelers. Jim Cleve was not among them. Her heart left her throat then, and she breathed easier. How could she meet him? Kells was in better shape than at noon of the preceding day. Still, he had to be lifted off his horse. Joan heard all the men talking at once. They crowded round Pierce, each lending a hand. However, Kells appeared able to walk into the cabin. It was Batewood who led Joan inside. There was a long room with stone fireplace, rude benches, and a table, skins and blankets on the floor, lanterns and weapons on the wall. At one end Joan saw a litter of cooking utensils and shelves of supplies. Suddenly Kells' impatient voice silenced the clamor of questions. I'm not hurt, he said. I'm all right, only weak and tired. Fellas, this girl is my wife. Joan, you'll find a room there at the back of the cabin. Make yourself comfortable. Joan was only too glad to act upon his suggestion. A door had been cut through the back wall. It was covered with a blanket. When she swept this aside, she came upon several steep steps that led up to a smaller, lighter cabin of two rooms, separated by a partition of boughs. She dropped the blanket behind her and went up the steps. Then she saw that the new cabin had been built against an old one. It had no door or opening except the one by which she had entered. It was light because the chinks between the logs were open. The furnishings were a wide bench of boughs covered with blankets, a shelf with a blurred and cracked mirror hanging above it a table made of boxes and a lantern. This room was four feet higher than the floor of the other cabin, and at the bottom of the steps leaned half a dozen slender, trimmed poles. She gathered presently that these poles were intended to be slipped under cross pieces above and fastened by a bar below, which means effectually barricaded the opening. Joan could stand at the head of the steps and peep under an edge of the swinging blanket into the large room. But that was the only place she could see through, for the openings between the logs of each wall were not level. These quarters were comfortable, private, and could be shut off from intruders. Joan had not expected so much consideration from Kells, and she was grateful. She lay down to rest and think. It was really very pleasant here. There were birds nesting in the chinks, a ground squirrel ran along one of the logs and chirped at her. Through an opening near her face, she saw a wild rosebush and the green slope of the gulch. A soft, warm, fragrant breeze blew in, stirring her hair. How strange that there could be beautiful and pleasant things here in this robber's den. That time was the same here as elsewhere, that the sun shone and the sky gleamed blue. Presently she discovered that a lassitude weighed upon her, and she could not keep her eyes open. She ceased trying, but intended to remain awake, to think, to listen, to wait. Nevertheless, she did fall asleep, and did not awaken till disturbed by some noise. The color of the western sky told her that the afternoon was far spent. She had slept hours. Someone was knocking. She got up and drew aside the blanket. Batewood was standing near the door. "'Now, miss, I've supper ready,' he said, "'and I was reckoning you'd like me to fetch yours.' "'Yes, thank you, I would,' replied Joan. In a few moments Woods returned, carrying the top of a box, upon which were steaming pans and cups. He handed this rude tray up to Joan. "'Sure, I'm a first-rate cook, miss, when I've something to cook,' he said with a smile that changed his hard face. She returned the smile with her thanks. Evidently, Kells had a well-filled larder, and as Joan had fared on coarse and hard food for long, this supper was a luxury and exceedingly appetizing. While she was eating, the blanket curtain moved aside and Kells appeared. He dropped it behind him, but did not step up into the room. He was in his shirt sleeves, had been clean-shaven, and looked a different man. "'How do you like your home?' he inquired, with a hint 
of his former mockery. I am grateful for the privacy, she replied. You think you could be worse off, then? I know it. Suppose Golden kills me and rules the gang and takes you. There's a story about him, the worst I've heard on this border. I'll tell you some day when I want to scare you bad. Golden? Joan shivered as she pronounced the name. Are you and he enemies? No man can have a friend on this border. We flock together like buzzards. There's safety in numbers, but we fight together like buzzards over carrion. Kells, you hate this life? I've always hated my life, everywhere. The only life I ever loved was adventure. I'm willing to try a new one, if you'll go with me. Joan shook her head. Why not? I'll marry you, he went on, speaking lower. I've got gold. I'll get more. Where did you get the gold, she asked. I relieved a good many overburdened travelers and prospectors, he replied. Kells, you're a, a villain, exclaimed Joan, unable to contain her sudden heat. You must be utterly mad to ask me to marry you. No, I'm not mad, he rejoined with a laugh. Golden's the mad one. He's crazy. He's got a twist in his brain. I'm no fool. I've only lost my head over you. But compare Mary and me, living and traveling among decent people, and comfort, to camps like this. If I don't get drunk, I'll be half decent to you. But I'll get shot sooner or later. Then you'll be left to Golden. Why do you say him, she queried, in a shudder of curiosity. Well, Golden haunts me. He does me, too. He makes me lose my sense of proportion. Beside him, you and the others seem good, but you are wicked. Then you won't marry me and go away somewhere. Your choice is strange, because I tell you the truth. Kells, I'm a woman. Something deep in me says, you won't keep me here. You can't be so base. Not now, after I saved your life. It would be horrible, inhuman. I can't believe any man born of a woman could do it. But I want you. I love you, he said, low and hard. Love? That's not love, she replied in scorn. God only knows what it is. Call it what you like, he went on bitterly. You're a young, beautiful, sweet woman. It's wonderful to be near you. My life has been hell. I've had nothing. There's only hell to look forward to. And hell at the end. Why shouldn't I keep you here? But Kells, listen, she whispered earnestly. Suppose I am young and beautiful and sweet, as you said. I'm utterly in your power. I'm compelled to seek your protection from even worse men. You're different from these others. You're educated. You must have had a, a good mother. Now you're bitter, desperate, terrible. You hate life. You seem to think this charm you see in me will bring you something. Maybe a glimpse of joy. But how can it? You know better. How can it? unless I, I love you. Kell stared at her, the evil and hardness of his passion corded in his face, and the shadows of comprehending thought in his strange eyes showed the other side of the man. He was still staring at her while he reached to put aside the curtain, then he dropped his head and went out. Joan sat motionless, watching the door where he had disappeared, listening to the mounting beats of her heart. She had only been frank and earnest with Kells. But he had taken a meeting from her last few words that she had not intended to convey. All that was woman in her, mounting, riding, hating, leaped to the power she sensed in herself. If she could be deceitful, cunning, shameless, in holding out to Kells a possible return of his love, she could do anything with him. She knew it. She did not need to marry him or sacrifice herself. Joan was amazed that the idea remained an instant before her consciousness, but something had told her that this was another kind of life that she had known, and all that was precious to her hung in the balance. A falsity was justifiable, even righteous, under the circumstances. Could she formulate a plan that this keen bandit would not see through? The remotest possibility of her even caring for Kells that was as much as she dared hint. But that, together with all the charm and seductiveness she could summon, might be enough. Dared she try it? 
If she tried and failed, Kells would despise her, and then she was utterly lost. She was caught between doubt and hope. All that was natural and true in her shrank from such unwomanly deception, and all that had been born of her wild experience inflamed her to play the game, to match Kells's villainy with a woman's unfathomable duplicity. And while Joan was absorbed in thought, the sun set. The light failed, twilight stole into the cabin, and then darkness. All this hour there had been a continual sound of men's voices in the large cabin, sometimes low and at other times loud. It was only when Joan distinctly heard the name Jim Cleve that she was startled out of her absorption, thrilling and flushing. In her eagerness, she nearly fell as she stepped and groped through the darkness to the door, and as she drew aside the blanket, her hand shook. The large room was lighted by a fire and half a dozen lanterns. Through a faint tinge of blue smoke, Joan saw men standing and sitting and lounging around Kells, who had a seat where the light fell full upon him. Evidently a lull had intervened in the talk. The dark faces Joan could see were all turned toward the door expectantly. "'Bring him in, Bate, and let's look him over,' said Kells. Then Bate Wood appeared, elbowing his way in, and he had his hand on the arm of a tall, lithe fellow. When they got into the light, Joan quivered as if she had been stabbed. The stranger with Wood was Jim Cleve. Jim Cleve in frame and feature, yet not the same she knew. Cleve, glad to meet you, greeted Kells, extending his hand. Thanks, same to you, replied Cleve, and he met the proffered hand. His voice was cold and colorless, unfamiliar to Joan. Was this man really Jim Cleve? The meeting of Kells and Cleve was significant because of Kells's interest and the silent attention of the men of his clan. It did not seem to mean anything to the white-faced, tragic-eyed Cleve. Joan gazed at him with utter amazement. She remembered a heavily built, florid Jim Cleve, an overgrown boy with a good-natured, lazy smile on his full face and sleepy eyes. She all but failed to recognize him in the man who stood there now, lithe and powerful, with muscles bulging in his coarse white shirt. Joan's gaze swept over him up and down, shivering at the two heavy guns he packed, till it was transfixed on his face. The old, or the other Jim Cleve, had been homely, with too much flesh on his face to show force or fire. This man seemed beautiful. But it was a beauty of tragedy. He was white as Kells, but smoothly, purely white, without shadow or sunburn. His lips seemed to have set with a bitter, indifferent laugh. His eyes looked straight out, piercing, intent, haunted, and as dark as night. Great blue circles lay under them, lending still further depth and mystery. It was a sad, reckless face that wrung Joan's very heartstrings. She had come too late to save his happiness, but she prayed that it was not too late to save his honor and his soul. While she gazed, there had been further exchange of speech between Kells and Cleve, and she had heard, though not distinguished, what was said. Kells was unmistakably friendly, as were the other men within range of Joan's sight. Cleve was surrounded. There were jesting and laughter, and then he was led to the long table, where several men were already gambling. Joan dropped the curtain, and in the darkness of her cabin, she saw that white, haunting face, and when she covered her eyes, she still saw it. The pain, the reckless violence, the hopeless indifference, the wreck and ruin in that face had been her doing. Why? How had Jim Cleve wronged her? He had loved her at her displeasure, and had kissed her against her will. She had furiously unbraided him, and when he had finally turned upon her, threatening to prove he was no coward, she had scorned him with a girl's merciless injustice. All her strength and resolve left her momentarily. After seeing Jim there, like a woman, she weakened. She lay on the bed and writhed. Doubt, hopelessness, despair again seized upon her, and some strange, yearning, maddening emotion. What had she sacrificed? 
his happiness and her own and both their lives the clamor in the other cabin grew so boisterous that suddenly when it stilled joan was brought sharply to the significance of it again she drew aside the curtain and peered out golden huge stolid gloomy was entering the cabin the man fell into the circle and faced kells with the firelight dancing in his cavernous eyes hello golden said kells coolly what ails you anybody tell you about bill bailey asked golden heavily kells did not show the least concern tell me what that he died in a cabin down in the valley kells gave a slight start and his eyes narrowed and shot steely glints no it's news to me kells you left bailey for dead but he lived he was shot through but he got there somehow nobody knows he was far gone when beady jones happened along before he died he sent word to me by beady are you curious to know what it was not the least replied kells bailey was well offensive to my wife i shot him he swore you drew on him in cold blood thundered golden he swore it was for nothing just so you could be alone with that girl kells rose in wonderful calmness with only his pallor and a slight shaking of his hands to betray excitement an uneasy stir and murmur ran through the room red pierce nearest at hand stepped to kells side all in a moment there was a deadly surcharged atmosphere there well he swore right now what's it to you apparently the fact and its confession were nothing particular to golden or else he was deep or all considered him only dense and shallow it's done bill's dead continued golden but why do you double cross the gang what's the game you never did it before that girl isn't your shut up hissed kells like a flash his hand flew out with his gun and all about him was dark menace golden made no attempt to draw he did not show surprise nor fear nor any emotion he appeared plodding in mind red pierce stepped between kells and golden there was a realization in the crowd loud breaths scraping of feet golden turned away then kells resumed his seat and his pipe as if nothing out of the ordinary had occurred end of chapter eight